Okay. O tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Dominic Stevens tōku ingoa. No te tai ohanga ho. Huri noa i te whare. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I'm Dominic Stevens, Chief, Chief Economic Advisor at the Treasury. Um, we're going to have a bit of a, a gear shift at the moment. Um, I call it Economics Unplugged. So instead of a, presenting a paper, we're going to have a panel discussion. And I think um, what we want to get at here is some of the practicalities of um, implementing variable fiscal policy. I mean, it's easy to say, OK, we need to expand fiscal policy in this way, or we might have to contract it in the future. But we've just been through some really big changes in, in fiscal policy. Uh, and we wanted to just talk a little bit about what some of the practicalities faced by chief economists in the public sector have been through that experience. And what are the, some of the economic issues that chief economists in the public sector are facing? And I think just to challenge the, um, the theme of the day further, we've got a mix of macro and micro economists um, in front of us. Um, you know, I remember my undergraduate days getting asked, I had a macroeconomics exam question, and it was, you know, can you comment on this particular model? And I basically wrote, I thought it was rubbish because it relies on an upward sloping labour supply curve, and in last week's um, labour economics lecture I was told that labour supply curves are backward sloping or vertical or S-shaped, but certainly not upward sloping. I got a terrible grade. Um, but that thought has really stayed with me ever since, that basically macro really needs its, its micro underpinnings and its reality checks from, from micro. So anyway, um, on the panel with me, we have Bronwyn Croxon. Uh, if you just raise your hand, Bronwyn. Uh, so Bronwyn is Chief Economist and GM of Strategy at the Ministry of Health and is currently working on the big health system reforms, so good luck with that. Um, <laughs> Jung Ha is uh, Chief Economist, Head of the Economics Department and Member of the Monetary Policy Committee at the RBNZ and is our sort of hardcore macroeconomist on the panel. Um, <laughs> Joanne Leung. Uh, Joanne is Chief Economist at the Ministry of Transport and is currently working on transport emissions, transport safety, appraisal and evaluation methods and non-market valuation for assessing transport costs and benefits. Um, and Donna Perdue from Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, uh, Chief Economist at, at, the, at MB, and has a great interest in, in new strands of thinking in economics like Mariana Mazzucato, um, Kate Rawworth, uh, uh, and actually got, got her out last year to New Zealand. So we've got a real mix of public sector Chief Economists in front of us. I'm going to ask a few questions and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for, for you to, to um, throw some questions at us as well. Um, Donna, I thought I'd, I'd just start with you. Mm -hmm. um, as I say, that you know, getting Kate Rawworth out out here, um, uh, you know, thinking about new economics. Can you give us a sense of where you, th how you think that new economics is changing or challenging economists in New Zealand, um, and how's it affecting policy work in your area? Sure. Thanks, Dominic. Um, kia ora koutou katoa. Um, so I guess I should probably start with what I mean by new economic thinking um, and the term that's kind of uh, thrown around, I guess. Uh, it's um, not so much new as in um, original, but new in as an alternative to the dominant um, neoclassical economic thinking that's underpinned our institutional frameworks and our policy thinking, um, and certainly the public discourse for, I guess, the last 30 odd years or so. Um, and so in that sense, I guess it's not really challenging um, economists, or certainly not academic economists, but uh, it's more challenging us as policy makers and um, you know, the way we think about economics in the, in the general public environment. So um, my interest in uh, new economic thinking was actually triggered when I was working at uh, Treasury, working for Garol, and he challenged us, I remember, in a meeting um, to ask ourselves the question of whether or not we really believed that the current macroeconomic frameworks were fit for purpose. And at the time, I remember thinking, well, hard to say yes um, post-GFC, but what's the alternative? You didn't really want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, and so I guess my curiosity was sparked then around, well, what would the alternatives be? And when I moved to MB, um, 
at the time, we were just uh, going through a change in government and uh, when I first went into MB, the focus was all around productivity. So in terms of our economic objective, it was really focused on how do we make the New Zealand economy more productive. And then the new government came in and the objective was no longer just productivity, it was productive, sustainable, inclusive um, activity. And so I was like, well, how does that change the way we do policy? How does it change, you know, does it change the need for different, or give us need for different tools and techniques? And so I guess from there I started digging and I was really curious as to how the thinking was evolving. And that's when I came across uh, Kate Rayworth's work um, around donor economics and also Mariana Mazzucato. So it started initially with those two economists, but then I, uh, I guess I stumbled across this whole movement, um, as the way I describe it, um, of new economic thinking and really this um, you know, challenge across academia of how we are you know, reconceptualising the economy and what the objective of um, economic policy is. And um, so, yeah, it sort of really started there. Um, and I guess the other thing that really started me thinking about uh, different approaches was from a microeconomic perspective and looking at the structure of the New Zealand economy and my role and how that's changing, I started looking at some of the massive structural drivers of change that um, is in front, are in front of us. So climate change, ageing populations, um, shifting power dynamics uh, internationally, um, technology disruption, all of those things. And I was really curious as to how our policy settings and tools, et cetera, were helping us think through well, how do we deal with those things? Were we actually thinking about that in our policy work? And the short answer, without wanting to criticise, I'm just stating where I, my thinking was at, was that um, we weren't really thinking about those things in a systematic way in terms of the way we were doing policy. So, um, yeah, I guess where I've, where I've gotten to um, in terms of the challenge that that's creating, and, and I guess we as public sector chief economists think about this all the time, um, is how do we actually bring all of that development in the economic thinking space, certainly post-GFC, because there's been huge developments in the tools and techniques we can use um, around how we think about the New Zealand economy. It goes well beyond behavioural economics, um, and things like randomised control trials or, you know, using microdata in our research. But we've got a whole, you know, there's a whole lot of different ways of thinking. So evolutionary economics, ecological economics, and I hadn't even heard of half of those things. So, you know, look, it's really, so how do we bring that to some of the work that we're doing? Um, yeah, so then I guess uh, the donor economics thing, um, obviously, uh, Lots of people hate it, certainly academic economists seem to hate it, they don't think it adds anything new. Um, I guess in some sense that's true, but for me, what donor economics has brought is to the general public, um, it's made uh, economics accessible, but it's also uh, provides a, a more compelling framework for how we think about the issues of today. So the donor basically, you know, putting a position out there of the whole point of the economy is to meet the needs of the people within the means of the planet. So I think it's brought a whole lot of um, interest into, back into economics, where economics was in decline post-GFC because we didn't seem to have the answers. And I think so it's really lifting the debate. Um, sorry to go on. Mariana Mazzucato's work um, has been really influential, I guess, in my role at MB because of the um, interest in industry policy and her thinking around uh, the mission economy, but she's written three books, if you're not familiar with her work, The Entrepreneurial State, which debunks the view um, that historically the only uh, sector that can, that can create value is the private sector, so she talks a lot about how a lot of the big technologies, particularly in the iPhone, were created through uh, government investment. So she debunks that myth that public sector can't create value and uh, puts forward, a, you know, there's, there's a bigger role for the state particularly in terms of the challenges that we face. She's asked questions around what we mean by value um, and talks at, you know, at length around you know, how, we've, uh, how we determine value um, and how we've basically moved to a society where um, it's no longer, um, you know, value reflects 
um, is reflected in price, but where price <coughs> determines the value. So lots of questions in that space. Um, but more recently, who work on a mission economy and um, you know, bring, bringing our thinking in terms of how do we use mission-led policy approaches to crowd in investment and catalyse um, innovation to provide solutions to the big challenges of today. Brilliant. Thank you, Donna. I think that, that point about public buy-in to um, economics is something I'll, I'll come back to at a later question, mm -hmm. actually. Um, Joanne, I was just wondering if you had any perspectives on how economic thinking is changing within the Ministry of Transport. Um, I certainly agree um, in um, some of uh, the key uh, point that you made around some of the um, new development, circular economy, um, uh, donor economics and stuff like that. One of the things that we've been thinking about for uh, transport is around the climate change uh, and the impacts. And um, a lot of cases, transport policy alone is not sufficient to reduce transport emission. And we require the sector, uh, the industry to, to, um, to change their behavior. And on the, um, related to the donor economics, um, parallel is the circular economy that you um, uh, might not have mentioned, but um, there's something that um, we have been thinking about um, around how this circular supply chain might, might evolve over time, because if we were to reduce emission, um, the industry will have to reduce um, the way they uh, emit carbon when they produce products uh, by maybe we use a bit more, um, recycle, uh, we produce, and therefore we reduce the um, uh, need to import raw materials and reduce some of the domestic and international transport uh, requirement as well. So we've been thinking about some of that uh, in a sense that um, uh, we want to uh, look at wider than just the traditional uh, way of thinking uh, transport policy in silo, we're thinking about more, more broader and how that um, other sector and other actors may behave would influence the effectiveness of transport policy. So I think that kind of thinking, I think, is really um, kind of useful to inform us the um, new way of thinking. Thank you. Um, so, Jung, I thought I might, might turn to you. So, I mean, we've got, I guess the theme of the day has been around how um, macroeconomic environment has changed. We see potentially an enhanced role for fiscal policy, particularly in you know, lessons from COVID-19. So I wondered if I could get some perspectives on that, but also with particular reference to what do we need to see from the public sector to actually implement um, expansionary or, or contractionary fiscal policy as required over the cycle? Yeah, um, good question. Um, for a couple of reflections from the COVID experience and probably just you know, looking at the, the history of sort of the big downturns we've had, by and large, you've got this emergency setting mode, you know, big negative shock, out of the box. By and large, fiscal monetary coordinates quite well. Um, so the, the challenge I think there is around um, knowing what, where fiscal policy can respond to these sort of idiosyncratic, unusual shocks. How do you, how do you actually pre-position for them? Um, historically, we've, d we've done it by preserving fiscal headroom, low debt target, that allows you the flexibility. But going forward, do you more actively go, well, actually, fiscal policy, there is a role to play. It responds well to certain shocks that monetary policy can't. Maybe there are operational constraints that actually limit the effectiveness of policy. How do you preposition fiscal policy in a way to deal with this, you know, in, in, case, in case of emergency situation? So, is it an EQC like fund? You know, you, you talk about social unemployment insurance. Does that sort of fall into that bucket? And then thinking about the nitty gritty details of, of what that means and designing and implementing that policy. Um, from a monetary policy perspective, I think there's still a lot to learn from us around effective lower bounds, you know, does it exist? Um, where is it? Um, or does the transmission channels for us actually change materially as we approach it? That's still a new area for us. So, yes, we know structurally interest rates are lower, so on the face of it, you have less headroom, but, um, you know, I think there's still the jury's out, actually. Does monetary policy still work as we approach this effective lower bound? So, in that emergency setting mode, I think there's still some work to do. The more fundamental question I'm hearing is around fiscal monetary coordination in sort of normal times, and it's probably a, the way I think about it is the restating of the government's economic objectives, as Donna put it, you know, now it's a productive, sustainable, inclusive economy. How I interpret it, it's almost bringing in more of a distributional lens um, into macro outcomes, and we know that monetary policy being a blunt tool, it's not well suited to distributional. doesn't mean we, we're not mindful of it. I think we need to understand it. Still an open question about 
And it speaks to what Carolee and Oscar were saying, you know, the policy coherence or the, uh, the consensus assignment. Are we actually saying we understand the distrib distributional impacts um, and we are happy with it and accept it and then use other policies to deal with some of the distributional stuff? Or are we now challenging ourselves to say, actually, um, we want a different reassignment um, in light of the, you know, the, the multitude of interactions that interest rates have, and particularly if we're going to use different monetary policy tools as well. So, yeah, I, that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, the challenge is out there um, around how do we actually put a coherent framework to say what is the new assignment, or should it be, should there be a new assignment around? What has actually served us quite well by and large around stabilising macro aggregates, but is that enough? Yeah, so it, one of the things that really struck me during COVID was um, we were looking for a massive fiscal expansion, but the, the Treasury, I was back at Westpac then, the Treasury was saying, well, there were debates happening within the Treasury about the, do we just send money out, the, the trade-off between just getting money out the door as quickly as possible and value value for expenditure, so, so value for money. Um, and, you know, Carol Lee sort of talked about, touched on that this morning. Um, Bronwyn, did you have any, any sort of... Um, <laughs> You know, within the health area, for example, if government said, right, we're going to massively expand or massively contract, how, what are some of the practical challenges you might face or some of the things you might encourage macroeconomists to think about um, fr from your area? How much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so first, can I thank you for the invitation and thank Treasury and the Reserve Bank for putting today on. I've really enjoyed the parts I've been able to come to. And I like sitting here and seeing so many familiar faces. So I'm obviously not the only microeconomist in the room. Mm -hmm. And I'm very, very pleased to see my whole team here. Hello, April and Joel. Um, any hard questions, they can field them. <laughs> One of the reasons I'm very happy to see so many people I knew from Treasury days here is um, I've been reflecting since Carolee's speech this morning on our mantra in the health team in the old days, which is health expenditure is not a force of nature. So there's always a risk, as you know, with getting money quickly out the door that it just goes into wages and salaries. And it doesn't go into what was being discussed this morning, which is either a timely fiscal response and or a quality fiscal response. So um, I had a preview, and I'm not going to give away any st state secrets here, of Treasury's long-term fiscal statement last week. And no surprise, it projects ongoing increases in health expenditure, which, given that how hard we're struggling with containing the deficits, is not 100% helpful because it almost gives the sector a target. So it loosens some of the signalling. And of course, what we're trying to do at the moment during a massive reform programme is keep everyone's eye on the ball. So the Minister of Finance is very concerned about performance, not just financial performance or performance, but we're all concerned about sustainability and making sure that there is a value for money lens on additional funding. So. One of the things I just wanted to reflect on in the challenges around um, health spending is it's not a force of nature, but sometimes it's subject to forces that are stronger than nature. So many years ago, um, before my Treasury days, I worked in the United Kingdom, and I did some work with the NHS there. And we were trying to contain the budgets of the really big, powerful trusts, the hospitals. Um, one of them, who was trying to which was trying to expand its budget, uh, responded by bringing in a freezer truck to act as an overflow morgue. It got front page attention, it led the news items, and ministers put untold pressure on us to increase expenditure. So when we're talking, and Carolee mentioned the political economy, that's what we're working with. We're working with some of the most powerful stakeholders in the world. We're also working with really powerful expectations. Um, we now spend more on every person who's aged more than 85 now than we did 10 years ago. 
that's public expectations. We can do more, so some of it's a good response to change in technology, and so expectations isn't necessarily a bad if it's been properly thought about and marginal benefits are increasing. But it's worth mentioning, I think, because healthy aging doesn't reduce long-run health costs, it comes as the result of increased health expenditure. Um, I'll, I shall pause there. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, Donna, did you have a... Yeah, I just wanted to make a point around um, the question around the quality of the spend. So I think um, one of the things we need to consider in you know, the speed versus quality and, and the trade-offs, so in part, I think the quality of the spending goes to what's the vision that we actually have for the New Zealand economy. Because you know, when, when you're thinking about um, quality, part of it will be where do you think you're going to get the most value for money? And then it comes to, well, what is it that you value? What, are the, what do we value as New Zealanders for the New Zealand economy? And that also comes to the question of when we're thinking about um, you know, fiscal spending, What's the direction, right? Like, like there, there's, a, there's an issue around where we think we're, we, you know, we want to go and, and where we think their opportunities are, um, particularly given the big challenges that, are, that we're facing into. So I think... Right, so we've got, we've got four economists on a stage now and we're, gonna, we're, we're right into it, which is, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, Joanne, um, uh, hand over to you next. I just wanted to, one thing um, I'd like to unpack at this point is you know, quality of spending and bang for buck, really, in fiscal expansion. One of the big themes that I've taken away from today is the difference between um, a fiscal expansion that's aimed at, well, government investment versus government consumption. Or, or Carol Lee's way of putting it this morning was things with an intergenerational benefit are more worthwhile than things that don't have that. So when we think about um, government investment, very much in your area, you know, getting money out the door, it's not just um, is it efficient, but can you do it at all in, um, in, in infrastructure. I wondered if you'd, you'd add some comment to that as well as your, your, yeah, your, your yeah, point you I wanted was, to add I here. Was, yeah, yeah, thank you. When I was hearing um, Bowen and um, Donna's comments on that, I thought oh, um, it's quite related to the transport infrastructure. Um, during the recovery uh, last year, um, we get together quite quickly um, when we were in lockdown Think about how to um, inform the minister, uh, the government at that time, where to invest, because we need to um, think about uh, the principle to actually do the investment, how to retrain off speed and uh, quality. So one of the things, um, I think uh, social policy can have gen intergenerational uh, longer term impacts, but infrastructure also have um, potentially have that as well. Because when we um, have our transport uh, outcome framework developed, it's actually modeled on the um, Treasury uh, Living Standard Framework. And um, when we uh, look at the COVID response, we look at three main principles. Basically, the first one is that we want to preserve the assets um, to people, especially um, on, on services, so that people can have access to essential services. So we don't want to uh, lose that. So anything that help us to bring that into the um, the, the level requirement that we will probably can kind of get the uh, money out of the way and uh, to the, out of the door to maintain that. Secondly, we want to take a low regret approach. Um, anything we do, we want to make sure we uh, align with the design board outcome framework. So um, basically a traditional strategic set, uh, effectiveness and efficiency criteria. And thirdly, that related to intergenerational uh, impact is actually, we want to make sure the work that we are selling away can actually help us to um, deliver transport as a sustainable um, uh, kind of system um, into the future. That once that process are uh, balanced uh, between economic growth, social and environmental um, aspect. So um, there are um, quite a lot of project still delay under the process, even under normal circumstances, not COVID circumstances. They often they are delayed because of cost change, estimate change. Maybe sometimes the uh, groundwork required um, estimate may, may have um, underestimated and things like that. And during COVID, we also have some uh, delays that's kind of unavoidable. But even that, um, we thought that um, there were certain things that you can um, kind of implement uh, relatively quickly, but we don't want to trade off that quick, uh, the speed with um, the quality because we want to make sure we invest in the right thing. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Um, I thought we'd pop over to, to Bronwyn, actually, and I'll, I'll come back to you next, on the next question, Jung. Um, 
But Bronwyn, I mean, again, I was struck a little bit with, well, and, and Carolee talked about capacity constraints with getting infrastructure investment out the door, and there was this dichotomy between consumption, government consumption and government investment, and I sort of thought, well, hang on, health spending's got a long-term benefit. It can be actually be thought of as investment. And I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the how health spending sort of slots into wider economic thinking. Yeah, good question. Because, of course, um, health spending is a significant part of GDP. Um, our recent estimates, which are actually a lower bound on total health spending, suggests that at least 10% of GDP, and we're pretty sure we're undercounting what happens in the private sector because, of course, the private sector is a very big part of health spending. Mm -hmm. And there are areas where the health, um, health arrangements, what are currently DHBs, are the largest employer. And, of course, when we set up Health New Zealand, it will have 70,000 employees and be co contracting directly from a huge number of providers. There's that angle. I think, and I think I've talked to you about this, it's, of course, very important to distinguish between health as a contributor to labour force participation and health as a contributor to economic growth. And most of the studies I've seen, the macro studies, well, they're micro, well, whatever they are, they, um, they confuse correlation and causation and just look at the relationship between aggregate health spending by country and growth. And those studies show a correlation in low-income countries, but there's no clear pattern for high-income countries. So while we know that we help get people into work and help people stay in work, we're not at all sure that that contributes to productivity. I could go on. <laughs> and it, it probably, I, I will go on. Um, <laughs> it varies, I, my, my, my intuition is it varies within New Zealand by population group. Both on both dimensions. And I do want to raise it because in the early days of planning for this, we were talking about what we, we were talking about asking for research. What, what do we need research on? And in fact, in health, we need research on this. We need good research about the impact of health expenditure and health services on human capital formation and from that on economic growth. We think at the moment, based on work that I think you might have been involved in, Bob, that its primary effect is through education. But, um, sorry if I have that wrong, um, we need to know this so we can, not because that's the only reason we invest in health services, but because it matters. The other thing I'm going to say, since I've got the microphone, um, is, of course, one of the things we've seen over the COVID response is the role of health in social capital and social capital formation. Brilliant. Right, we'll, we'll, um, we'll see if we... Jung, you've been, you've been um, a little quiet, so we'll bring you in on the next question. It's a tough one. Um, <laughs> One of the things I love about being back in Wellington is just, you know, bumping into journal economic journalists and economists. And I bumped into a journalist on the street um, a while ago, and that person pointed at the Reserve Bank building. And this, this comes back to your um, social licence stuff. Um, that person said, those guys, their social licence is in danger because people don't like what's happening to the housing market, and they think it's the Reserve Bank's fault. So the, the monetary policy framework that we have is, for better or worse, out there in society, yeah. I think its, it's social licence is um, being questioned in some, some um, areas. So I guess, I'll, you know, how do, we, how do we think about that at the Reserve Bank? Um, mm -hmm. and, and how do other agencies think about this housing question in the context of the social licence for economics and people's sort of disappointment? Yeah, great question. Um, how would I answer that one? <laughs> yes, it is our fault. <laughs> is that, is that, is that? No, I think um, there are structural and cyclical factors, right? So it's important to understand there are long-standing structural factors that are driving interest rates lower, irrespective of what we would have done. And internationally, central banks are finding themselves in the space anyway. So there would have been a, a housing price effect through just the, the long-term structural factors. Um, the question about have we exacerbated it? Um, it comes back to our mandate. You know, we're, we're thinking hard about 
we have this inflation and employment mandate. Um, we've been challenged around the distributional impacts. And I, I don't know where, the, where we sit on this, because yes, you can say the haves and have not to know are we making it worse for some, particularly around housing. Um, but as Golnara has researched shown, well, it's not clearly obvious that monetary policy is regressive. Um, inflation, the impacts of inflation are regressive. Um, we look at it from a cross-sectional perspective, but there's also a time life cycle dimension to inequality that, that hasn't been articulated yet. Um, it's the work's still to be done, right? So I'm not sitting here saying, um, you know, the problems are all our doorsteps and we're the cause, I think, but we're part of the, the conversation. Um, and this comes back to, you know, the restating of the broader economic objectives of the government and looking holistically at where does the policy coherence sit? Is it enough to say, yes, monetary policy, interest rates do effectively control and target inflation, and that's enough? Um, and that we have other policies that can deal with some of the other distributional impacts um, that are caused by the central bank moving interest rates up and down around the cycle to achieve stabilisation of broad aggregates, inflation, and unemployment, um, or employment, depending on how you phrase it. So, you know, fully understand the issue, fully understand the social licensing aspect of it. Um, I, what, what I am pleased about is the conversation has moved on beyond simply it's all about interest rates. We're now having a much more nuanced and richer discussion about, well, the other blockages around regulatory use, um, impediments elsewhere that actually are preventing, um, you know, the fact that there's ex excess demand for housing and it's been there for a long time. Why does that continue to exist? Um, so, yeah, I'm... I'm Understand, but I don't know what the what the answer is, other than we are fully aware that we have a part to play. Other perspectives? Yeah. I was actually wondering if the bank could take on some of the problems in the health system. <laughs> 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 we, we, we are, um, the social license question is a good one. I mean, we're very aware in the ministry that, in fact, the best value for money might be additional funding into housing rather than directly into health services. Mm. Um. Um, I, I mean, it's obviously huge, hugely important in terms of um, MB's focus around uh, you know, broader productivity, um, thinking about you know, where funds are being invested, when, uh, you know, if a lot of our small businesses are able to get into business, um, when they, because they own their own home, and if they're locked out of that, what does that actually mean in terms of business dynamism going forward? Um, there's lots of issues for us from an MB perspective in terms of the building standards. Um, you know, we have a responsibility for that, creating warm, safe, dry housing. You know, so there's, you know, we, we think about housing a lot, although nowhere near as much as when it was, you know, housing was part of MB. Um, and obviously we have immigration policy. Um, so, not sure I want to go into <laughs> that, that argument. Um, but, you know, the, these are, uh, yeah, the huge issue for us, um, uh, just, just thinking generally around the future of the New Zealand economy. Mm. Okay, well, if you don't want to go into migration, I think I'll go into a much more challenging area, which is, um, so we talked about before, there was a great paper on the distributional impacts of monetary policy, and, and again, one of the things that struck me was, well, distribution of wealth or income is not, the only, is not the only dimension of distribution. Now, one fact we have to face in New Zealand is that in all of the ups and downs of the business cycle, whenever there's a down, the people who end up unemployed are massively, disproportionately Māori and Pacific. Mm. Uh, and I just, you know, this is, this is quite a confronting fact, and I just wonder what work you're doing at your agencies or, or how you're thinking about this type of issue. Um, Open to the floor, whoever wants to, to go first. Um, okay, go. Oh, I'll start with you, Joanne. Yeah. Okay, um, I can start. Um, um, so, traditionally, uh, transport is very good at doing uh, CBA appraisal and, 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 and kind of those analysis. But we haven't really been investing a lot in understanding how impacts are distributed. And, of course, understanding about Maori or other um, ethnicity impacts is important. Um, recently, we, we have been investing in um, doing micro simulation model to understand how um, potentially uh, transport policy can affect different people in different locations, um, um, potentially different time uh, as well. Um, and that's very, actually very really useful to help us understand, um, for example, Maori in um, South Auckland or some other space, uh, what, what impact um, some sort of transport policy like pricing might have impact on them. 
Um, and additionally, um, in the last couple of years, we developed uh, our, uh, hey, our Hawakaki, um, our ministry uh, Maori strategy. So basically that guide the work that we do um, to engage with the Maori and Pacifica community to understand um, the transport needs and understanding what opportunity um, and also issue they, they are facing that we, um, and how, how best we adjust those. Um, and, and I think um, in terms of, uh, I think we touched on a little bit on climate change earlier, um, a lot of things um, we can learn from the Maori community, for example, because they value the land, they value the environment uh, and the resource, um, uh, and they have the traditional uh, way of um, looking after those and we can learn from them. Yeah, so um, at MB we have, um, in the area that I work in, we have both the Māori Economic Development Unit and the Pacific Policy um, Economic Development um, Unit. So it's a huge focus for us and uh, immediately post-crisis um, we commissioned a piece of work around the Auckland Pacific skill shift and so that's basically looking at, um, uh, in South Auckland, Pacific Peoples at the firm um, community and family level. It's um, an experimental approach in terms of trying to understand the dynamics of how Pacific Peoples in that area have been impacted by COVID and we're hoping to be able to use the insights from that to inform our future policy. So that's just one, one area. Yeah, um, so I think it's really important that we, we, we are, that we do work and we are doing work to better understand some of the business cycle dynamics and the, the stylized facts and you've uncovered it, you know, there is a lot more cyclical amplitude um, disproportionately in certain um, cohorts, ethnicities, young versus old. I think it's important to understand that. Um, the next, the other thing is actually, what do you what do you do with policy? It's not clear that just because you identify it that it's suddenly, you know, the policy prescription jumps out. Um, you know, I still think... Um, we understand disproportionately um, Māori Pacifica. Does that mean you change the monetary policy settings to adjust for? I'm not sure that's the obvious one. You think about the totality of our impact, you know, stabilising unemployment, what is the best contribution? Is it still the best contribution that monetary makes is stabilising an aggregate? And you re rely on other policies, whether it's industry policy or education policies, to better target some of the distributional differences you're seeing? Or, you know, you can go to, I guess, um, the research that um, San Francisco Fed, in particular uh, President Mary Daly has, has been doing is showing, showing actually there could be a, a, a macro policy um, implication and that there should be, there could be an asymmetric policy response. So it sort of goes on, you know, draws on the fact that the Phillips curve is flattened. You don't seem to get the big inflation spikes when the economy is running hot. You know there are long-term economic effects, hysteresis from people being out of the labour market. So maybe there is a long-term welfare benefit by running the economy hotter than you would otherwise do, mm. just to drag in people from the fringes of the labour market, which would benefit disproportionately certain cohorts. So is, is that one of the lessons that we need to think harder about? The research is still to be done, but at least that gives you a lens on it could mean quite significant for macro policy stabilisation, or it could actually mean nothing, and it's actually better suited to some other, other policies to deal with some of those sort of more distributional aspects. Yeah, it's front and centre. I want to distinguish between the treaty and equity. So we've got significant health inequities, both in access and outcomes, across a number of population groups. And we've got treaty breaches. So the Crown's conceded it's breached the treaty with respect to primary health care in one of their um, whole inquiries. And there's several other health ones going on at the moment. So this is front and centre in what we're doing and in the reforms. And if you like, I guess I think of it, and I don't want to belittle it by comparing it to a Roald Dow story, but it's the golden ticket in the heart of the reforms. It's so John Fanga, who is, a, is one of our DEPSEX, talks about the last time there was a step change for Māori being 2000, and the time before that when there was a significant change and a restructure that freed up the way that Māori were able to participate in the health service, make sure services were in the right place for the right time in the right way. So yes, as I say, it's our golden ticket. It what's, it's what drives us forward. I was having a, a fun, I would, 
talking to a former colleague this morning and we were saying actually for us one of the exciting things in the reforms is the prospect of joining up our data systems because of course they're across a number of things but there's no way that you can get a placard that says better data get behind us but in fact that kind of change will enable better measurement and better understanding of providing health services equitably and in a way that's consistent with our treaty partnership. Thank you very much. Um, I thought I'd actually open the floor to questions, um, if there are any from around the audience. And if, oh, yep, we've got a microphone. Hi everyone, I'm Hamish Pepper from Harbour Asset Management, not officially an economist at the moment, <laughs> strategist, so uh, prepare for the dumb question. <clears throat> um, I mean, I guess I'd like to ask particularly this panel their thoughts around the way in which we've approached the vaccination programme here in New Zealand, that um, there's been a, a lot of discussion today about the you know, efficacy and usefulness of um, that targeted and, and, and temporary um, response and one that you know lifts living standards as well with it I think if I remember correctly they were the three conditions and uh, I, I think my view is that we are still in a state of vulnerability in, in New Zealand when it comes to um, the proportion of our population that is vaccinated so any, any thoughts on uh, looking back at, at the response we've had and the response going forward uh, whether you would do anything differently uh, whether we have the scope uh, to do anything differently, whether we had the scope to do anything differently. Thank you. MB set up the vaccination program. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mariana Mazzucato's book's all about patents. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you talking about the rollout or just the, the purchasing? I guess specifically it would be that, you know, it, we seem to have scope still uh, to be able to uh, expand fiscal spending. Um, so it won't be the case that we would lose access to, to markets. We wouldn't screen as having a debt load that is unsustainable. So I suppose in a different state of the world, why could we not have adopted perhaps, say, the Israeli approach of just paying up for uh, vaccines to ensure we got them early and we, we had... We sat in a place today where there was a sufficient portion of the population that uh, is vaccinated and we, we don't have the vulnerability that we currently currently do and the inability, for example, to open borders um, as quickly as uh, we might otherwise want to. I don't want to take all that one. <laughs> no, we might I be. Might be. Good, I think it's a really good question and it's a really useful one to pose. Mm. Um, I don't have an answer for you. Um, it's been an environment of extreme uncertainty, so the cautious approach matched the uncertainty and I think also reflected our relatively privileged position. Yeah. Uh, the jury is a little bit out on how successful the Israeli campaign has been, um, but I think it's a really useful discussion and debate. That's, that's such a... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so no, I'm not going to answer that. Eh? <laughs> it's a really tough question. I think you've stumped the panel. We've got a question. Move on to another question, shall we? Thank you, Hi, I'm Wintao from uh, Wakakatahi. So my question is probably more around the um, transport. So, like, we've been observed that there's definitely, like, New Zealand upgrade program you know, investing heavily into the infrastructure. And we also observed that the NLTF, National Land Transport Fund, actually got really constrained funding environment. So I'm, I'm actually kind of bit concerned around, you know, when we are having crown funding directly poured into targeted uh, projects where, say, uh, ended up is mainly focused on Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch. But in, in the meantime, because, you know, the view fuel taxes is kind of decreasing due to the COVID, people travel less. So the revenue from the land, uh, land transport fund is decreasing, where 
potentially there's going to be crowd out effect on you know investment in some smaller areas i mean um, uh, that might not that might be okay but just want to get an idea of like whether this potential thinking around that and like is that a problem we need to address thank you right um so i think um since you're from Walker to Kaye, but you probably have some of the answer um, at your end because you dish out all the NLTI funding. Um, but nonetheless, um, I think, to me, I think there are um, another bigger problem beyond that, <coughs> especially around um, how we tackle the climate change problem. Because if we are tackling climate change problem properly, you have to reduce um, the level of travel. You have to change the way people, what sort of vehicle people drive. So you. You, the system currently we have, like, we use the charges and fuel side duty, we will have to change because at the moment, a large proportion of the funding comes from fuel side duty um, and, some, uh, and also uh, parallel, they will use the charges. Uh, if people um, driving electric vehicles, for example, they then won't be paying the fuel side. So the funding will get even um, uh, reduced uh, even more. And if we were to um, achieve the net zero uh, emission target um, going forward, then we really need to uh, get people to travel less because um, changing the fleet is just not enough. So if you are going to do that, um, therefore you, you probably um, end up with um, less kind of um, funding source. And that means that we really need to think hard what sort of infrastructure we want to invest in. Um, it's not investing in for current um, demand, it's actually investing for future generation. What do you see, um, what do we want to see the future generation to have in terms of... Uh, transport system. So we just need to think about um, maybe potentially more encouraging public transport, encouraging more working cycling, we'll reduce the health um, expenditure <laughs> potentially as well. So they essentially um, totally change the way how we see solving a transport problem and, and at the same time thinking about what sort of funding system we need to actually achieve that kind of transport system we want to see. Yeah, I think I mean that, uh, that really builds on some of the stuff I was talking about earlier in terms of the, um, you know, the new economic thinking is starting to really challenge us to think much more longer term um, around what it is that we want to and need to achieve. Um, and so how do you have those conversations um, you know, within a, a, a country's borders, I guess, in terms of what it is that you want and then how you shape and, and drive into that direction? So a lot of the... Um, like Joanne's saying, a lot of the investment decisions will be um, much more easily made once we know exactly where it is that we want to go. And that, those are, I mean, no, that's really difficult to, to get there. And you know, it's not a thing that New Zealand is used to, to doing because in our, under the previous um, economic thinking, the market determined where the market where where we went, right? And now I think there's an understanding that actually given the massive challenges that are facing us, leaving it to the market alone um, to determine is, is uh, not going to get us where we need to be. So how do we, how do we all work together to, to drive to the, to the direction that we want? Mm. Right, I think we'd better um, uh, draw things to a close. I'll get one last question, and you've got 20 seconds each, um, and we'll, 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 start, we'll start at the middle with, with Bronwyn. Um, if you could get one... So what is the one research question you'd like the research community to be looking on that would to be looking into that would help you as a public sector chief economist? I put one on the table. Higher priority for me actually is around the quality of the institutions that will help us with the quality of our expenditure. Thanks, Jan. Oh, good question. Um, I I think the distributional stuff, you know, the macro data in New Zealand, it's, it's limited. We know, you know, there's, there's only so much mileage you can get out of looking at, you know, output, inflation, unemployment. Um, the micro data is, is sort of a rich data source. It's untapped. Um, and then thinking how you actually blend that into the traditional macro frameworks, I guess that's the, the challenge that sits before where I, where I stand. Joanne? Um, I want to have a could be a macro in, in, in this um, my discussion. Um, um, I would like to um, see, uh, get your help to um, help me uh, in, in the sense that when we do modelling of uh, public transport policy, um, quite often we don't really know what, I'm thinking about the transport, uh, climate change, we don't really know what other countries are doing and wh what the economy is going. So another thing we want to kind of trade off, um, or think about trade off is the economy 
um, transport assets and, and many others. Um, traditionally, we just assume like the GDP will grow the same way, 2% a year. I just want people to uh, give me other alternative scenarios, like if we were to tackle climate change, what other potential scenario might be in terms of how the economy, macroeconomy might be going um, in the future, then we have a better or different counterfactual for us to understand the trade-off that we're making. Um, yeah, sorry, longer than 20 seconds. No, that, that's okay. It was, a, it was an exceptionally good answer. So, <laughs> last word is with you, Donna. Um, uh, probably for me at the moment, it's um, what's the dominant theory of value in New Zealand? Brilliant. A uh, <laughs> short and sweet. Thanks very much. Um, okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Uh, thank you very much to our, our panel. Um, and I will hand over to Peter to close proceedings.